Hello and welcome to the webinar and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Kat Gumal, Head of Education and Professional Development at the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation. And in this webinar, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the background to the Chartered Transport Planning Professional Qualification and the different routes to gaining chartership and your eligibility for gaining this qualification. Um, I'd also like to introduce our speakers. We have Billy Parr, who is Head of Network Development at Essex County Council, um, who unfortunately can't be on, on camera this morning, but he is here and will be speaking to you. Billy is an experienced TPP reviewer, and he'll talk to you about the role of the reviewer um, and some advice on, on what reviewers are looking for. And we'll focus on some of the units which, which some candidate, candidates have found more difficult to demonstrate than others. Um, we also are joined by Amy Barnett, who's going to give you the candidate's perspective. Amy is the Principal Transport Planner at Atkins and successfully gained Chartered Transport Planning Professional in 2021. Amy will tell you about her journey to becoming Chartered and give you some top tips from her experience. I'm also joined by my colleague Greg Saunders, who will be helping with the questions. There'll be time for questions at the end of the webinar today. So if you look at the uh, dashboard, which probably appears on the right hand side of your screen. There's a question box which you can expand using the sort of the little arrow uh, in a box thing and you can type any questions in there and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, we try and keep sort of the questions quite general. We can't answer specific questions about your sort of individual experience but we are happy to take all sort of questions about the process and, and the um, experience of going for a professional review. I'd uh, also like to say we'll be recording this webinar and the recording will be made available afterwards. So to start with a bit of background to the qualification, Transport Planning Professional was launched in 2008 to provide professional recognition of the skills, knowledge and competence of transport planners. It was developed jointly by CIHT and the, the TPS, the Transport Planning Society, and it continues to be managed jointly by the two organisations, but with CIHT doing the administration. So when you come to submit your application, you'll be dealing with, with me or my colleague Greg Saunders, who's managing the questions today. It's open to members of CIHT, TPS and the CILT, so you need to be a member of one of these before you can submit your application. And to gain TPP, you need to demonstrate your level of competence in a number of different units, covering the breadth of knowledge and experience expected of a transport planner. Um, a review of these units took place over the last few years and new units were launched in March 2021 to reflect what a modern transport planner is expected to do. And I'll explain a little bit more about the units in a bit. So why would you uh, want to gain Chartered Transport Planning Professional. There are lots of benefits of gaining this professional recognition. Firstly, you have an opportunity to reflect on, on your work, your competence and everything you've achieved so far in your career. Candidates for the TPP qualification need to demonstrate an appreciation of a broad range of transport planning procedures and techniques and the competence to work effectively in your chosen areas of the profession. Preparing for the qualification is a fantastic way to see how far you've come and to also identify any development areas for yourself. You'll of course get a certificate um, and recognition that you've achieved this benchmark of professional competence in your profession. And you get post nominals, letters after your name. And because CIHT has a Royal Charter, everyone who successfully achieves TPP can get chartered status the highest level of recognition, which means you can have the post nominals CTPP. And the qualification is increasingly recognised by employers, so it can lead to improved uh, career and salary prospects. To be eligible for Chartered Transport Planning Professional, you'll usually have at least five years of practical experience of transport planning, and often you'll have more than five years. It's not about the amount of time you've spent in a role, but the breadth and depth of experience that you've developed. As I mentioned before, to apply, you need to be a member of CIHT, TPS or CILT. So if you're not already, make sure you become a member of one of those. And then depending on the level of experience and qualifications that you have, there are a number of different routes which are shown 
here in this diagram, which you can also find in the TPP guidance documents. And I'll just um, sort of zoom in on some of this and explain a little bit more about it over the next couple of slides. So firstly, I just want to touch briefly on senior route. This route is only suitable for a small number of candidates who have significant experience at senior level. So if this is you, you'd have evidence of broad knowledge gained from more than 15 years of transport planning experience at a senior level. You would have made a significant contribution to the transport planning profession, and you would need to demonstrate a higher level of competence in more of the units than standard route candidates. And this would be assessed through a senior route um, application. I won't be going into more detail about the senior route today, but the TPS are hoping to run a webinar on the senior route very soon. So please contact us if this is something you'd be interested in attending. The most common route to achieving Chartered Transport Planning Professional is the standard route, where you do a professional review interview. The first step is to show that you meet the knowledge requirements for TPP, and there are a number of ways of doing this. Firstly, you may have an, a TPP approved masters and you can check that. There's a list on, on our website and the TPS website that lists all of the approved transport planning masters. And these have been assessed to, um, as demonstrating that you have met the TPP knowledge requirements. And that means you can proceed straight to professional review once you have enough experience in transport planning. So there isn't a minimum period of time in practice you need before you're eligible you do need to have assessed your own competence and be confident that you can demonstrate the unions to an appropriate level. If you have a master's that isn't TPP approved or you have a bachelor's degree, you can either submit a portfolio of technical knowledge, a PTK, or complete an approved professional development scheme. So a PTK is a written report that you submit to demonstrate how you've gained the same level of knowledge as someone would have from doing an approved master's. And the sort of things you could use as evidence could be sort of teaching from that, that non-approved um, master's or from the degree, or if you've done the transport planning apprenticeship, it could be evidence from CPD courses that you've attended. It could be um, from attending a software providers workshop or a seminar about some legislation. Or it could be evidence that you've got from learning from others or by reading and studying whilst working on a project. Once you've passed your PTK, you can then progress to professional review. If you don't have a degree or master's but have the Level 3 Transport Planning Technician Apprenticeship or other relevant qualifications at this level, you'll need to do a technical report. Again, this is to demonstrate how you have the same knowledge as someone would have gained from doing an approved master's and you'll be asked to write a report explaining how you've got that level of knowledge through your work-based experience. <clears throat> the alternative, um, as I mentioned, is um, if you don't want to do a PTK or, or technical report, or you want a slightly more structured approach to your professional development, is to take an approved professional development scheme, such as the PDS, which is run by the Transport Planning Society, to support you to develop your competence that you'll need to demonstrate at professional review. You might already be signed up to the PDS by your employer, but if um, this is something you're interested in, you can find out more about it on the TPS website. And Amy will be talking um, a bit about this later when she talks about her journey. If you're not sure which route you need to go down, um, you can use a the free initial assessment service that's on the CIHT website. You just need to provide details of your academic qualifications and your CV and we'll advise you which route you would need to take to demonstrate um, that you've met the knowledge requirements. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on, on the standard route and specifically on professional review. So this is once you've demonstrated that you've met those knowledge requirements, either through having an accredited master's, completing a PTK, technical report, or the professional development scheme. The professional review has two elements, a portfolio of evidence, and then a professional review interview, including a 10 minute presentation. Through both of these elements, you will need to demonstrate that you have the required level of competence to be a chartered transport planning professional. 
for the TPP, there are four different levels of competence, ranging from awareness, where you have a general understanding of an area and its role within transport planning practice, all the way up to proficiency, so an ability to work without supervision and to supervise others. For each of the units, there's a minimum level of competence required. You aren't expected to be an expert in all of the areas, but you will need to demonstrate proficiency in some. This flexibility and competence levels allows you to tailor your submission to really reflect your strengths. So these are the units that uh, you'll need to demonstrate for TPP. You can see there are three professional units which focus on, on the professional skills that you need to be a Chartered Transport Planning Professional, so around leadership, communication and collaboration skills, and personal commitment to professional standards in the profession. There are then six core technical units and an additional four technical units. So here you've got the minimum requirement of competency that you'd need to dem demonstrate with A being awareness, E experience and P proficiency. So you can see you need to demonstrate proficiency in all of the professional units. You also need to demonstrate proficiency in data and at least three other technical units. And you need to demonstrate a minimum level of experience for one of the additional technical units, unless you've already chosen to demonstrate proficiency in one of these. For senior route, this increases um, and you would need to demonstrate proficiency in five technical units as well as data and would need to demonstrate experience in at least two additional technical units. So take some time to read the units and see what level of competence you think you would and be able to demonstrate as this will help you to identify any gaps that you need to address before you apply and will also help you to choose which units to demonstrate at which level when you're ready to submit. You will collate all of your evidence into a portfolio of evidence which you'll need to submit as a PDF file. Um, the portfolio will contain an application form, copies of your academic certificates, a CV, an organisational chart which clearly shows where, what you, where your role is in the organisation, a project synopsis of up to three projects and um, that you will talk about in your presentation and that's got a word limit of 1200 words, um, a competence record form for each of the units and that they, they have a word limit of 500 words each and you'll need to do one for each unit. You need to do a C PD record um, showing 25 hours of CPD from the past two years and a personal development plan which sets out your plans for your professional development. Your portfolio can also include additional documents uh, like project reports or technical papers as appendices but these should only be included if they're directly referenced from the competence record forms or the project synopsis. So the professional review interviews are usually held remotely, so you'll be sent a link uh, for you to join and, and to meet your reviewers. You'll be greeted by a member of the education team who will welcome you, check everything's working and ask you for your photo ID. Your professional review will always be conducted by two reviewers who are experienced transport planning professionals themselves. And the professional review interview itself lasts around 90 minutes and starts with your 10 minute presentation, followed by a professional discussion where your reviewers will ask you questions about your portfolio of evidence and give you an opportunity to demonstrate your competence. You won't be told the result on the day as the reviewers make a recommendation to the professional standards committee who confirm the results. So you'll usually receive written notification of your results within eight weeks. So these are some dates for your diary. We've obviously got a deadline coming up quite soon. So if you're aiming for this deadline, I imagine you're just putting the, the finishing touches to your portfolio. But we also have um, the second deadline for this year, which is was in September, with interviews taking place in November. We've now got dates for 2024 on our website as well. And they're at sort of very similar times. There's one in April and one in September. If you were to apply for the senior route, you can apply at any time. And if you need to do a, a PTK or a technical report, you can also submit those at any time. 
Um, I'm going to hand over to our other speakers in a moment, but if you do want um, any more information, there's lots of information on our website at the address you can see here. And you can also contact um, either myself or, or colleagues at the, the TPS if you've got further questions. So I'm just going to hand over to, to Billy now. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, can I just confirm, first of all, that you can hear me before I, I blabber on? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so it's great to have the opportunity to, to be part of the, the webinar today. Um, apologies um, that I can't turn my camera on. We're having a bit of an IT meltdown at work today, so I've had to join via my phone. Uh, but to be honest, that's probably to everyone's advantage. Um, what I'll do is uh, just say a little bit about uh, TPP from a reviewer's perspective. Um, but before I get into that, um, just in, in terms of my background, um, I'm Head of Network Development at Essex County Council um, and I obtained TPP myself back in 2017. So I took this, the standard route, as Kat just explained, and um, different people have different approaches to this, but the, the approach that I took uh, was to pull together my portfolio um, in some downtime that I had between projects. So I just finished working on a big project um, that I was involved in for a couple of years or so. I had about two or three weeks before I started working on my next project and I took the opportunity to, to really pull together my portfolio um, as, as best I could in, in that time period and added to it thereafter. But that was the way that, uh, that I approached this uh, qualification. Um, Amy, I'm sure as well, will, will tell you about her experience of that too. Um, in terms of uh, why I am a reviewer, so I've been a reviewer since 2019. Um, and for me, uh, it's a good way for, for me to give back to the profession, um, which I appreciate sounds a bit corny, um, but I am a big advocate of transport planning and uh, the positive difference that we as transport planners can make to society. So for me, it's a nice way of, of giving back a little bit to that. Um, it's also a great way for me of finding out about all of the interesting projects that candidates have worked on all over the UK and, and indeed beyond the UK in some cases. Um, so, so that's really uh, my motivation for, for being a reviewer. Um, I appreciate different people have different motivations about why they want to uh, obtain TPP and, and Kat's already mentioned some of the benefits. Um, in my case, I was working uh, with lots of engineers, lots of surveyors at the time who were all certified with their respective um, professional bodies and I felt like that was something I wanted to do in my role as a transport planner. So that was really my motivation. But what I can say is that I'm very glad that I did it and I, I definitely think it was worth the, the time and effort in, in doing so as well. So if I can move on to the next slide, please, Kat. So just to, to explain um, in a little bit more detail the, the role of reviewers in, in the process, um, there's essentially three steps. So uh, as you can see here, I broke it down into the pre-review period, uh, the review itself, and then post review um, and just to touch on each of those before the review begins um, there are two reviewers uh, nominated for each candidate so uh, each of the reviewers will individually go away and review the portfolio of evidence that's been submitted um, and in reviewing that portfolio uh, we will develop questions uh, things that we want to understand in a bit more detail perhaps uh, it might be that we want to probe uh, some of the information that's been provided. And that includes the information on each of the professional units, but also uh, what's set out in the CPD um, and the uh, professional development plan. So it's the whole, uh, the, the full extent of the, the portfolio that we'll be looking at. And then also as part of that free review period, the, the two reviewers will get together and we will basically agree the approach that we're gonna take at the review. So. Uh, typically, one of the reviewers will take the lead and uh, that will be agreed beforehand in terms of who does that. We will agree how we want to approach the questions. It might be that um, each reviewer leads on a particular unit. Um, it might be that uh, the reviewers decide to uh, alternate questions that, that are asked during the review itself. There's, there's a number of different approaches that can be taken, but that will generally be agreed be, before the review takes, takes uh, starts. And then once that's done and the reviewers have agreed to questions that they, they want to ask at the review, um, we, we move in into the review. So um, 
that typically takes between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, in my experience, it's more likely to be towards the 90 minutes. So there's quite a lot that we need to get through. Um, we will definitely do our best to, to make sure it doesn't go beyond that. Uh, but that's the sort of time frame that we're looking for for the review itself. Um, and then uh, the, the first step really is for the, the lead reviewer to explain the format. So explain how the review is going to work. Um, the fact that we'll go through each of the units in turn, uh, there'll be a presentation to begin with. There will be an opportunity for the candidate to ask any questions at the end of the review as well. We'll then proceed to uh, to undertake the interview. There may be some sort of opening questions just to to get everybody in the swing of things in terms of um, you know motivation for applying for TPP or experience to date. Um, and then the, the first step will be the presentation. So candidates will deliver their presentation in which they have 10 minutes to do so. And there'll be some questions on that um, as well. Um, the, the focus uh, tends to be on the units at which candidates have, have indicated they have a competency of proficiency. Um, so that's where most of the focus will, will tend to be. Um, but you know, where we need to, we will cover uh, the other units, certainly the other experienced units and perhaps some of the knowledge and awareness units as well. Um, and that will become a sort of bit, a bit clearer as we go through the, the slides. At the end of the, the review, um, the lead reviewer again will explain the next steps, the fact that uh, the reviewers will pull together uh, their views and uh, the documentation that's required. We will make a recommendation as to whether the candidate's been successful or not and um, any feedback that we think is uh, is appropriate. And then that will go to um, the Professional Standards Committee. So that, in a nutshell, is the, uh, is the role of the reviewers. Um, all in all, I'd say uh, for each candidate, it takes about a day's worth of, uh, of the reviewer's time. So there's obviously the, the review itself, which is a, a couple of hours, about two and a half hours or so. Um, then the, uh, the preparation beforehand and then the work that we do afterwards. So, you know, it's quite a big uh, uh, commitment for, for reviewers, uh, for each candidate that we're involved in. Um, what, what I would say, if I, if I can sort of use one word to explain what reviewers are looking for, um, I suppose that, that word would be breadth. So that's uh, breadth of experience and, and breadth of skills in a range of different units. But uh, the, the other thing that we're really interested in as well is, is the kind of appetite that candidates have for continued professional development. Um, so, you know, a willingness, whatever stage a candidate is at in their career, to continue to, to learn and to develop um, within the field. Um, and that's where the professional development plan comes in as well. So, in terms of, uh, I suppose, the mechanics of, uh, of the TPP from a real perspective, I'll just run through um, the things that you can see on the slide, slide now. So the first one is just to kind of dispel some, some common myths, if you like, um, that uh, certainly we, we've heard a few people suggest in the past. Um, reviewers do not have any prior knowledge of, of any of the candidates. Um, in fact, as part of the, the process that, that Greg and Kat will go through in, in allocating reviewers to candidate, we'll make sure that there are no conflicts of interest. So uh, reviewers shouldn't shouldn't know the candidate, uh, they shouldn't work for the same company, and there will be a, an exercise that's undertaken before the allocation of reviewers to ensure that's the case. Um, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I will not do any kind of research, any Googling or anything like that on any of the candidates before the review itself. Um, you know, I base my questions and my assessment purely on the portfolio of evidence that, that's provided. Um, another myth I think um, that I've heard before is that there are quotas. Um, so uh, CIHT, TPS are looking for X percent of, of candidates to be successful. Um, and, you know, we'll work to, to those quotas in doing the reviews. That, you know, it's just not the case. Um, you know, we consider each uh, applicant on on the merits in terms of what they say at the review and in the portfolio of evidence. And um, you know, the uh, the the results each time we do the reviews will kind of reflect the the interviews that have been undertaken. So certainly no quotas involved um, either. Another kind of common myth is that uh, if candidates have reapplied. So if they were unsuccessful first time round, the second time round, they will only be asked questions or the focus of the review will only be on those units that they hadn't uh, 
uh, been successful in last time. So if they deemed not to be proficient um, to the level claimed in uh, two or three units, those are the only units that, that questions will be asked on that. That's not the case. Uh, effectively, it's a it's a fresh application, a fresh review. So reviewers will ask uh, all of the questions that they think are appropriate on all of the units um, and candidates need to go into any reapplications with that understanding as well. In, in terms of preparation, um, I'd say one of the most important things is to understand the standards. So understand what is expected for each of the uh, the professional and the, the technical units. Um, and there's some really good guidance that's available on the CIHD website that the candidates can look at in uh, in preparing the application that's required. Um, I would say as well that this is a really good thing in which to speak to your mentor about. So um, it's always a good idea to to try and get a mentor, uh, a mentor within your company or somebody else that you know that's been through TPP previously um, that is willing to help. If um, you don't have anybody to hand that, that can do that role, then it, it may be that you can speak to, to Greg or to Kat and they can suggest somebody that might be willing to, uh, to be a mentor for you in, in pulling together the application. But definitely speak to them about uh, the standards, speak to them about what you think your strengths are, maybe what they think your strengths are if, if they've worked with you before. Um, make the, the best use of them as, as you can. And one of the questions that you might want to discuss with your, your mentor is whether you know, you, you're ready to uh, to pull together the application and to, to go for TPP right now. Generally, um, the, the expectation is that candidates will have a minimum of five years experience. Obviously, it depends on the candidate, but, you know, have that honest discussion with your mentor about whether you're ready at this particular point in time. In terms of framing the discussion, um, you know, this is something that, that candidates can, can do to, to help themselves, I think, um, as they go into the review. So part of that is about thinking about how you structure and content, uh, uh, the content you include, sorry, and, and the structure um, that you use for your portfolio evidence. So, um, you know, simple thing, but just make sure you, you proofread it, read it. There shouldn't be any spelling mistakes or, you know, uh, silly grammar things like that, that that might distract the reviewers in, in reviewing the portfolio in the first place. Um, you can also uh, use hooks, if you like, um, for want of a better term, within the portfolio. So it may be that you uh, give an example of when you've worked on uh, a particular aspect of transport planning within a particular project. Um, you can give some examples and, and that will tend to sort of pique the reviewer's interest. And it may be that they decide to ask a question based on that. So you can be clever, if you like, about how you, uh, you structure the portfolio of evidence as well. Um, one really important thing is is to remember this, this is about you and, and what you've done. So it's not about, um, you know, the projects per se that you've worked on or, you know, what you've achieved as a team. It's about what you've done personally. So make sure you, you know, you uh, you make that come across. So talk about you rather than, than we as a team or, or, or me as a team. Um, it's, you know, it can be uncomfortable for, for people to do that sometimes, but what we're really interested in is your experience. So make sure that comes across as well. The other uh, thing to say about framing the discussion is that the presentation that you'll do at the start, the 10 minute presentation on a project, or in some cases projects that you've worked on, that's a really good opportunity for you to, to set the stool, uh, if you like, set out your stool at the start of the, the review. Um, and it's also a good way to, to demonstrate firsthand how you've met some of the professional units. So particularly P2 around communication, collaboration, you know, if you can uh, make a good job of your presentation, then you're kind of halfway there, to be honest, on, on that particular professional unit. In terms of uh, on the day, uh, we've already said that the reviews uh, are expected to take between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, so it's quite a lot of time to, to be talking, actually. Um, and there's a lot to get through, as I've said. I think it's important that where you can, you try and use concise and considered responses to, to questions that are asked. Um, the, the, the danger is that if you talk too long on, uh, you know, in, in answering any particular question, there's just not enough time. Um, you know, if you do that repeatedly, there, there won't be enough time to get through everything that the reviewers need to get through. Um, and it will mean that reviewers will need to step in and, 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 and curtail answers kind of mid-flow. And that tends to make it disjointed. So what I would say is that when you ask a question, just take a moment, uh, you know, a few seconds if you need to, 
to think about what's being asked and, and, and the answer you want to give and then try and make your your response uh, concise and, and to the point where you can. Um, make sure you use examples. It's always good about to hear about how you've applied um, some of the things that you've done on particular projects um, and things that you've worked on in the past. So um, use examples and use specific examples as well, um, rather than saying, uh, you know, I've got experience of working on transport assessments from multiple different schemes. Um, you know, we want to hear about which scheme um, that, you, that you're referring to and, and what your role is on that. So be specific where you can. Um, be prepared. Um, so I must say that the icons that I've used today are a little bit tenuous, I'm afraid. So this particular icon uh, is the, the the new logo for the Scout Association, actually. Um, and of course, the logo for the Scouts is Be Prepared. So that's where that came in. Apologies for that. Um, but yeah, make sure you are prepared. Make sure you, you understand, um, as I say, the standards that uh, the reviewers will be using to assess you. Um, make sure you um, you've got a good understanding of what you said in your portfolio as well and um, coming on to a couple of the pitfalls perhaps that you might want to try and avoid um, there are uh, you know a couple of months between submitting a portfolio and then undertaking the review um, you will be expected to uh, to be able to talk about everything that's in your portfolio evidence and um, so it's a good idea to refresh yourself on, on what you said um, uh, another pitfall that people might want to try and avoid is using too much kind of technical jargon of course we use it uh, you know every day in our in our jobs but um, the reviewers won't necessarily be familiar with some of the acronyms that, that you might use on a regular basis and um, try and avoid using uh, too much of that if you can because again that that can make things disjointed if the reviewers need to clarify you know a particular acronym or uh, some technical jargon that they're not familiar with moving on to the next slide please Kat and just in terms of what comes next, so uh, the, the reviews have uh, been completed. What the reviewers will then do is complete the documentation that is required. So each reviewer will produce uh, uh, an individual assessment um, based on uh, their, uh, their perception of the review. And uh, we will then get together and produce a combined assessment with a recommendation to the Professional Standards Committee um, and also some suggested feedback as well. Um, and as Kat's explained, you won't hear the outcome of the review on the day. Um, the uh, decisions will all be ratified by the Professional Standards Committee. Uh, and typically that committee meets within eight weeks or so, I think it is, of the, uh, the completion of the, the reviews. Um, with regards to, to the feedback, um, I would absolutely recommend, you know, taking on board uh, the feedback that you get and that's whether you're successful or, or unsuccessful. You'll get you'll get feedback uh, in both cases. Um, if you're unsuccessful, um, you know don't don't be too disheartened. I think just speaking personally, you know um, some of the things on on which I've I've learned the most uh, come from occasions where I haven't been successful first time round. So don't beat yourself up over about it. You know make sure you take on board the feedback and and you try and learn from that where you can. In my particular case, um, one of the uh, uh, the, the, the suggestions, the feedback uh, uh, that I got was that I should consider getting some experience outside of London. Um, and admittedly, I've not gone very far, uh, just across the border in Essex, but uh, you know, I have heeded that uh, that advice as well. If I can move on, please, Kat, to the next slide. Thank you. So just to say a little bit more about the, the skills units, um, Kat's already covered this, so I'm certainly not going to dwell on it, but there are uh, three categories if you like of, of skills units so there's the three professional units um, that you can see there and those uh, the requirement the requirement for competence there is is proficiency in, in all three of those cases um, and then you've got 10 technical units six of which are core units and four are additional um, the only technical unit on which it's mandatory to to demonstrate proficiency is data and that's because data is so integral uh, really to the work that we do as transport planners. So make sure you take the time to, to really think about the, uh, the evidence and the examples that you want to provide for, for that particular unit. Um, if you follow the standard route, then you will be required to indicate um, proficiency for uh, three other technical units. Um, and if all of those proficiencies are in the, the core units that you can see there, T1 to C6, 
then you also need to indicate experience in one of the additional technical units. So it sounds complex, but the guidance is uh, is really helpful in terms of um, you know what you need to to do on this. And again, I I would take the time, you know, really have a think about what you think your your strengths are, your your weaknesses are, where you can best demonstrate proficiency. Um, the the definition of proficiency, if you like, is the ability to undertake work unsupervised, um, but also to be able to supervise others in the the undertaking of work in that particular area. So that's the kind of bar that we're looking for when we talk about proficiency. Um, and then the last point I would I would make on this is um, it, it, it's perfectly possible. It may be that you want to uh, to indicate that you're proficient on more than the the minimum um, requirements. So it could be, you know, you, you could um, suggest that you're proficient in, in all of the units, um, which, you know, somebody with, with lots of experience um, in, in transport planning may well, uh, you know, decide to, to do that. Personally, I would, I would caution against it um, because, as I said um, a few minutes ago, that the review will tend to focus on the units where candidates indicate they are proficient. So if you indicate you're proficient on absolutely everything, um, it makes our job as reviewers more difficult. Um, and, and it's not necessary. Um, you're not going to get uh, any additional kudos, if you like, for, uh, for doing that. So whilst you, know, you might want to indicate proficiency in more than the minimum units, my, my advice would be to, to avoid doing that. Moving on, please, Kat, to the next slide. So um, Kat and, and Greg um, have just asked me to say a little bit more about three of the uh, the technical units, which are T4, T5, and, and T8. Um, and this is partly because as part of the, the last round of reviews in November 2022, uh, a few candidates were unable to to meet their claimed level of competence for, for these units. So I just wanted to touch on, on these briefly. Um, the best advice I can give on this, and I've, I've already said this, but I'll say it again, is, is to read the standards. Make sure you're, you're clear um, on on what's being uh, asked for here, so you know, read it, reread it, read it again, and and go through it as well with your mentor. Um, and as you can see here, I've just outlined, underlined. So this is my underlining here in red. Some of the sort of key things that uh, I think you might want to take into account in terms of what that particular standard is asking for. So taking this first example, T4 on on transport models on forecasting. Um, we're talking about you know different different methods. So it's all good and well being uh, an expert in a particular transport model, say, uh, whether that be a strategic model or local modeling or whatever it might be. But uh, you know the, the key word here is different methods. So we're looking for experience or at least understanding of more than one different type of, of modeling. Um, it's not just about modeling. You know, there's related analysis techniques as well. So there's other things that you can talk about in terms of forecasting, in terms of um, producing targets, for example, uh, when it comes to things like travel planning, that kind of stuff. So there's lots of stuff you can bring in there. And again, policies, plans and schemes um, that don't fall into the trap of thinking this is just about particular projects, you know, a transport infrastructure project, say, because it can be about plans, you know, think local transport plans, about policies. Um, you know, it might be um, transport policies within a local development framework, for example. So there's lots of things where um, you, you can you can bring in here. Um, choice is another big one. So you know, we we we're not uh, we we don't have to to necessarily just use one type of model. It might be that there's different options available to us, and it's thinking about the options that are available. Um, think about the fact that you know there's there's going to be a range of different outcomes that come from the models. Um, and it might be that you want to do some specific scenario testing, for example, to look at things like high growth, low growth, that kind of thing. So. These are the sorts of things that I, I think you you know you want to consider as part of this particular unit. Um, transparency is another big one. There, you know, uh, inherently is, is uncertainty that comes with modelling. Ultimately, it's a forecast. Um, so it's just being clear on on what what some of those uncertainties are and making sure that's transparent as well, so that people who are not as familiar with, with transport models perhaps at least understand you know some of the, the limitations. Um, and then the last one there is just understanding another mode, as I said at the start of, of modeling. So, um, you know, make sure you, you talk about more than the one different type of application when it comes to, to models and forecasting. Um, moving on, please, Cap, to the next unit. So I'm not going to go over this in any detail, partly conscious of time, but 
Um, again, read the, the standards. Um, there's some similarities in wording with the, the last unit that we looked at. Um, in fact, unit T4 and T5 are uh, to some extent related, so that's unsurprising. Um, but coming back to the point about Brett's, you know, we're uh, yes, we're interested in economic appraisal, but equally, you know, we we're interested in uh, the appraisal of, of safety uh, impacts, you know, impacts on the environment, sustainability, land use. There's, there's all sorts of different things that you can bring in here. Um, and equally, uh, yes, you know, the bread and butter of appraisal tends to be uh, about quantifying and monetizing impacts where we can. But that's not to say that non-monetized or non-quantified impacts aren't important. So definitely take the time to, to talk about your, your experience on that as well. Um, uncertainty, that's come up again. So that's another key thing that you want to think about. Um, but like I say, take the time to, to go through the standards and, and do so with your mentor as well, if you can. And then just finally, in terms of the, the last specific unit, please, Kat. Um, this is uh, applying the principles of transport system design. Um, some of the sort of key words here that I've uh, outlined are about, you know, emerging technology. So, yes, we're interested in established way of doing things, but we're also interested in your experience and your views of, you know, emerging ways of doing things as well when it comes to uh, transport system design. Um, requirements, you know, what are the requirements of specific stakeholders? How do you uh, know that you're delivering a project that, that meets its intended purpose? Um, there's lots of things that, you, you know, good things that you could, you could say on this. Um, and then interchange is another kind of key word there. So, you know, uh, we design transport systems um, and, and transport uh, networks so that they, they interact. Um, that interaction often comes at interchanges, so it's being cognizant and, and aware of that as well as part of your review. Just to, to wrap up then, if I may please, Kat, um, on the last slide. Um, the first point I would say is, you know, well done for, for showing an interest. Um, as, as I've said at the start, I think this is a really worthwhile thing to do. Um, and the fact that you've come along to, to this webinar today to hear more, more about TPP, I think, is a, is a good thing. Um, and, I, and that brings me on nicely to the next point, which is the, the next step, um, should you be interested based on what you've heard today, is, is to get started. That, that's the hardest, the hardest part, actually starting the process of pulling together your portfolio, thinking about your experience, the projects that you want to refer to. Um, it does need a, a bit of a concerted effort, or certainly it did on, on my part. Um, but, you know, once you get started and you get into the habit of, uh, of, of populating your POE, it might be that you choose to do that over two or three months, um, you know, just allocate maybe an hour, a couple of hours every week to, to update your portfolio so that it doesn't have to become too big a task. Um, that That's definitely the, the first step here, I'd say. Um, and the sooner you can get started, um, you know, the more time that you've got to, to get your portfolio in a good shape for um, the next deadline. Take the time, as I've said, to produce a good portfolio of evidence. This is your way of, of demonstrating your skills and experience. Um, so make sure that, as I said, you proofread it and that you're happy with all of the content. And also think carefully about your choice of competences as well. Um, and that, that leads on to, to using your mentor where you can. This is definitely not something you need to do on your own. Um, if you've got the option of having a mentor to, to help, then definitely make use of, of them. Um, goes without saying, really, but, but try and be confident on the day. Um, it's generally held on teams now, um, the reviews. So um you know we're, we're all used to uh, engaging via that that medium um be be confident where you can um remember that you know your portfolio and you know your experience better than anyone else on on that call you know better than either of the reviewers better you know better than anyone else because uh, it's your experience so bear that in mind when you're uh you know when you're uh going through your review on the day as well make sure you use i and not we um you know i, I can't kind of um, overstress really the importance of doing that where you can. And the last point, as I've said already, is to take on board any feedback that you get um, following the review. Um, that was it from, from me for now, Kat. Thanks very much. That's brilliant. Thanks, um, Billy. And now I'm going to hand over to Amy. Thanks, Kat. Can I just check you can hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Kat mentioned earlier, I'm Amy and I'm a 
Principal Transport Planner with Atkins based in our Cambridge office. Um, I joined Atkins as a graduate back in 2014 after completing a degree in geography at the University of Leicester. Um, and I achieved Chartered Transport Planning professional status in December 2021. Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please, Kat. Thank you. Um, so over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to run through my route to chartership and the experiences that I've gained along the way. I'll then share some of my top tips to consider when you're preparing your submission and looking forward to the review. Um, hopefully you'll see some consistencies with some of the things that Billy's already mentioned from a re reviewer's perspective as well. Um, so in 2014, I joined Atkins as a graduate transport planner. Initially, my work was focused on modelling and development planning projects. I worked on modelling projects for around the first 18 months or so of my career. And although modelling was not for me, um, the projects that I worked on provided me with the knowledge and experience required by the Transport Planning Society Professional Development Scheme and has also been particularly valuable as I've gone on to work across projects in other disciplines within transport planning that have an interface with model processes and outputs. Um, alongside my day job, I was also a regional rep on our graduate forum, which provided me with the opportunity to expand my network, gain exposure to wider business processes and lead small internal projects. So by 2019, I'd gained a broad range of experience, including working on business cases, scheme development, and across a variety of modes. I'd also undertaken a secondment to a local authority to work as an assistant project manager, supporting the development of a corridor, corridor scheme through preliminary design. This provided me with my first project manager experience. Within Atkins, I'd also begun to take more responsibility for the team and was involved in graduate recruitment for the first time. So these management and leadership experiences were particularly valuable in helping me achieve the Transport Planning Society Professional Development Scheme during 2019. Following completion of that scheme, in 2020, I became Atkins PDS manager and a mentor for two trainees within my office. I also began, began managing bids and projects within Atkins and worked across a number of multidisciplinary projects. I expanded my managerial and leadership roles further in 2021, becoming a team leader in the Cambridge office, developing a training pack for new starters and leading an EDI initiative for the UK and Europe business. At the end of 2021, I became a chartered transport planning professional through the standard route. I believe that the depth and breadth of experience gained over the previous seven years, both within transport planning and alongside my day job, was invaluable in achieving this um, chartership. Kat, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to share with you um, some of my top tips for a successful review. Um, I've grouped these into three categories. Uh, firstly, things to think about before you start to prepare prepare for the process, tips for preparing your submission, and finally, the professional review itself. So first of all, before you start, I would strongly recommend finding a mentor who is familiar with the scheme. If they have TPP, then that's great, but there's also mentor guidance produced by CIHT and TPS for those who don't. CIHT or TPS may also be able to find you a, a mentor if there are no other options. So also limited examples of completed units are available from CIHT and TPS to give you the best idea of best practice. A mentor with TPP may also be willing to share their examples too. It's really important before you start to make sure you fully understand the requirements of the route that you have chosen and what the competence re requirements are for that route and also what the requirements are under each unit. Once you've fully understood those requirements, requirements, you can then start to plan your route to completion. Map out what you need to do and when to meet the deadline. In terms of preparing your submission, I found that setting aside a little time each week to make progress little and often is, be is a better approach to attempting to do it all at once. A useful starting point is perhaps refreshing your CV so that your top 10 or 20 projects are like mini case studies and noting which units are applicable to those projects. 
you can then run through the units and bullet point your ideas to make sure you're identifying the right projects or evidence for each. You should then discuss with these with your mentor before you start writing. I wouldn't try and identify too many projects to include within your submission. Perhaps two to four projects or pieces of evidence for each unit should be sufficient to make sure you can fully bring out the detail of what experience you have. Use this to decide on which units you will claim proficiency or experience for. And then keep other evidence from your CV in your back pocket for the review. I found it useful to include a mixture of old and new projects to show your experience gained across your career. When you write your submission, make sure you write succinctly and break up your text with bullet points to help the reviewer. A lot of project context is not necessary, so get straight to the point of what you did. This can also help you save on words. If you're going through the standard route to submission, also use evidence from your master's or PDS within your portfolio of evidence. Whilst you're drafting your submission, I'd undertake frequent reviews with your mentor and don't leave the review until you've got a first draft of everything. It's super helpful to send across a couple of units before you get too far to make sure you're on the right track. Before, you're su before submitting, make sure you proofread your submission fully. Untidy submissions or spelling and grammar errors, errors wouldn't make a first good impression with the reviewers. And finally, don't forget about the additional requirements, including CV, development plan, organisation chart, CPD record and your project synopsis, and make sure you need, leave enough time to develop these. For your presentation, choose a project or closely related projects that cover as many of your proficiency and experience units as possible. You may end up answering some of the re reviewers' questions before you get to the interview itself. Make sure you practice your presentation to get it to no more than 10 minutes and revise for your interview. Remember the review is not an exam so you can take notes with you. I created a handful of cue cards as prompts and had my submission to hand to refer back to as well. As I mentioned before, having secondary examples of evidence from your CV that you can draw on if you get asked is really useful. You could also jot these down on your cue cards. Uh, making a note of the questions as you go along can also help to make sure your responses keep on track and answer the questions you're being asked. Also, don't be afraid to ask the reviewers to repeat the question if you need to. Um, and as Billy emphasised previously as well, in your responses to questions, make sure you emphasise what you did, how you did it and why you did it, rather than talking about what your team did. And then finally, before your review, have a think about the hot topics across the industry at the time, as you may get asked your opinion or thoughts on these and how they impact your work. So hopefully you found those tips helpful. Um, I think I'll now hand back to Kat for Q&A. That's great. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I can see there's a few questions uh, that have come in already, which I think Greg will put to us in a moment. Um, but if you have any questions, now's your chance to, to put them in that question box. Okay, thank you, Kat. Um, yep, so we've got a few questions which have come in. Um, first one, which might be best directed towards you, Kat, is what accommodations can we offer disabled candidates during the professional review process? Well, thanks, Greg. Um, for all of the <clears throat> qualifications that, that we run, not just CTPP, we, um, we offer reasonable adjustments but very much on, a, on an individual basis. We'd ask you to contact us and let us know what adjustments you'd want us um, to, to consider. We've always been able to accommodate requests. So it's been things like sort of perhaps extra time, um, breaks away from the interview or, or even having a chaperone, but, but do contact us if um, you'd like us to put some reasonable adjustments in place and we'll do what we can to accommodate that. Thank you, Kat. Um, so this one might be best directed um, to Amy, perhaps. Um, so someone said that they're coming up to four years in the transport planning career and they wondered whether energy would be better spent focusing on the PDS or waiting to start producing a portfolio for chartership later on down the line. 
Thanks, Greg. Um, I, to be honest, I found the PDS invaluable in my submission for the portfolio of evidence. Um, you can draw on the PDS evidence, um, obviously in your submission itself, um, but also across your interview. I think the PDS um, format gives you the opportunity to kind of jot down everything that you've learned, everything that you've done, um, and is a really, really useful um, kind of platform to to um, TPP. Um, so I would suggest that that PDS is still valuable. I mean, I passed my PDS, I think, after four, four and a half years of being um, a transport planner. So kind of the timescales that, that this person is looking at. So I would definitely think it's still worth um, progressing the PDS route. That's great. Thank you, Amy. Um, maybe a question that's best directed now to Billy. Um, what level of the what level of detail is needed on your CPD record? So from a reviewer, um, what are you looking for from a candidate CPD record? Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So I think there are templates that uh, are provided that people uh, can choose to use if they if they want to uh, for CPDs. Um, what we're interested in is the, the most recent two years worth of CPD for each candidate. Um, so it would be good to see some detail of uh, the activities, the CPD activities that candidates have been involved in. Don't need to go into too much detail there, um, but it would be good to understand whether that's you know attendance at a webinar, taking part in a training course, uh, or whatever else it might be. And uh, the other thing that we're looking for is that uh, that's kind of spread uh, to some extent evenly over that that two year period as well. So that it's, you know you're uh, in the habit of. Um, continuing with your professional development and um, taking advantage of opportunities when they come along. So, uh, you know, the, the, the date of each of those activities is, is another key thing that we're interested in for CPDs. Thanks. Thank you, Billy. Um, the next question might also be best directed to you, Billy. Um, so someone's asked, does the size or scale of the project referenced in the portfolio matter? And is there a limit for how many times experience in a particular project can be referenced for different objectives? So I think this might go back to your discussion around breadth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I personally don't think it, it matters too much. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, projects can be of, of very different scales and, and sizes and, and, and people will have uh, different roles within those projects as well. So in my particular case, um, I, I just spent a lot of time working on a Silvertown Tunnel project. So um, I use that frequently as an example of, of where I've got experience in, in certain things. Um, but I think it's always a good idea to, to try and refer to um, a few other, a few different projects as well. So I would I would suggest um, you know four, five, six different projects uh, within the, the portfolio would be appropriate more if you if, if you want to do that. Um, but like I say, it depends on uh, the roles that you've played within that project over how long you've been involved in in the project. Um, and you know what the experience was that you gained from working on that. That's great, thank you, Billy. Um, so we've got a question around mentoring. I don't know, maybe Amy, you might want to comment on this one. But who who can be a TPP mentor? And do, should they have completed TPP themselves, um, or can can you speak to someone who might be familiar with the requirements and get some support that way? Yeah, I think, um, Greg, you've probably just touched on it. I think anyone really can be a mentor. Um, there's mentor guidance available. Um, and as long as your mentor understands the requirements, that's that's the key thing. So they definitely don't have to hold TPP themselves. But I think working together to make sure that you've both got a good understanding of the requirements is the key thing. OK, brilliant. Um, Kat, just looking at time, shall we do one or two more? or? Yeah, I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question and then we'll have to, to wrap up. OK, um, so we've got a question about the PDS, actually. Um, so, Amy, I don't know if you could give a little more detail about what the PDS actually comprises. Yeah, of course. Um, so the PDS um, run by the Transport Planning Society is a development scheme um, that has a whole host of units um, similar to TPP and they broadly align with the TPP units as well. Um, and the PDS asks that you obtain either knowledge, awareness, experience or proficiency um, at all of those um, at all those objectives. 
So I think now they only ask for um, proficiency in the data objectives. So the PDS is very much your kind of awareness and knowledge um, foundation that helps you kind of on the steps towards TPP. Um, you can also kind of backdate it to previous work experience. So, for example, when I, I started the PDS scheme, I, I used previous work experience um, outside the industry um, and also some volunteering experience to kind of get a head start before I even thought about the work that I was doing within the industry itself. Um, so it's really broad to allow you to capture a wide range of evidence and experience and learning, um, including that gained within transport planning. Um, it, you, the review process is, is relatively similar um, to TPP, so you'd have an initial review um, with a reviewer after kind of a year or so on the scheme um, to make sure that you were on the right track, um, and then you would go for a final review, um, which also includes a presentation um, that's attended by a reviewer, but also your mentor as well that can provide support. Um, so I think, yeah, just all in all, it's a really good stepping stone um, on the way to um, TPP. Thank you very much. Um, we do have some more questions which have come in. Um, apologies that we don't really have time to answer all of those. Um, so what Kat and I will do is um, we will be able to download a copy of all the questions which were not answered today and we'll try to respond to those separately via email to you. But thank you very much for sending those in and I'll hand back now to Kat to conclude the session. Thanks, Greg, and, and thanks to all of you for attending. Um, and thank you to, to both of our speakers for their fantastic and really useful presentations today. Um, if you do have any further questions, then, then please contact us um, by email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And we look forward to receiving your submission very soon. So thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. <laughs>